I uh, want to call uh, Governor, Minnesota Governor Jesse Ventura to the desk. And uh, for the record, Governor, you might have to introduce yourself. <laughs> Perhaps spell your name, too. <laughs> First of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a thrill for me to be here because I don't think in my four years as governor I ever testified in front of a Senate committee. <laughs> so I'm breaking new ground here, so I hope you'll all bear with me and enjoy it. Now, I do want to set the table a little bit. I could get a little longer than what the two minutes allocates, but I remember when I first became governor and we were driving to an event and I was late and I turned to my security guys, I said, oh, we're going to be late. And my security looked back at me and says, Governor, no, you need to understand the rules. The governor's not late. Everyone else is just early. <laughs> <laughs> so having said that, if I go over the two minutes, bear that in mind. Um, I'm, I'm here because I started this. And as governor, I believed in hemp and cannabis back then. I believe in it even more now. And I want to be here. I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. And I want to be here when this passes into law. Because this is accumulation of a vision that I had over 20 years ago. And now it's coming to hopefully fruition, whatever the word is, it's going to happen, hopefully. But I want to tell you two stories why I'm so passionate about cannabis and hemp. And I please want you to listen to them. First story is this. Cannabis saved my life. Let me sink that in. Not me personally, but the 38th First Lady of Minnesota. And if I get choked up a little, bear with me. It was about 10 years ago, First Lady Terry Ventura started suffering from late stage um, seizures late in life seizures. She was seizing two to three times a week. And these were the type of seizures where you can't do anything but comfort the person, make sure they're breathing, make sure they're not swallowing their tongue, everything like that. Our life was over. We went to the doctors. They put her on four different seizure medicines. First one did not work. First two did not work. Third one did not work. Fourth one did not work. All had bad side effects. In desperation, we broke the law. We drove to Colorado. I have friends there that I met in my home in Mexico. And when we got there, my wife seized in the hotel the night before we got there. When we arrived there, uh, our friends went in, they had the ability, they bought the cannabis, three drops under the tongue, right? My wife took the first three drops under the tongue and has not had a seizure since. None. Marijuana cannabis stopped the seizures. Not our medicine. Now what did we face? I had to break the law. My friends had to send it to me in Minnesota. Well. I kind of took the attitude of Dirty Harry Callahan when I said, well, then the law is wrong because I'm putting my wife ahead of Minnesota law. And I'll admit that today. I did. So we got our what we needed. Minnesota finally legalized, quote, medical. My wife qualified immediately, got it. But you know what the story is then? Because we're so restrictive, and that's what you're here to change today, hopefully, because it's so restrictive, it costs me $600 a month to keep my wife seizure free. Insurance won't pay for it. Nobody will pay for what works. They'll pay for what don't work, but they won't pay for what worked. And today, my wife, it's now, because you've expanded, it's down to 300 a month now. If it was Colorado, it would be $50 a month. Why? Because in spirit of true capitalism, when you get more out there, it drives prices down. That's what capitalism's supposed to do, drive prices down. 
w the way you're set up today, you got a monopoly in Minnesota. I don't know who's providing whatever, but if you open up the doors, c capitalism will take hold. Prices will go down. I don't want no other family to have to go through what my family went through. I don't want anyone to have to do that, what I went through. My son Tyrell, what was the other thing? Oh, I know. Then here's the other thing, and this is a little off the subject, but it's still going to tie in. You're going to have to come up with an age, right? How old are the people going to be when you approve this? Well, we're going to go back in my life then, 50 years ago. At 18, I went into the United States Navy. 18. I spent one year being trained and became a Navy SEAL. I then deployed to Southeast Asia and Vietnam for a nine-month deployment. While I was in BUDS training, underwater demolition SEAL training, I turned 19. While I was deployed on my first deployment to Vietnam, I turned 20. I returned home. Within one week, I went into my executive officer and I demanded to go back to Vietnam. He looked at me and said, but you just got home, you can't do that. He said, Navy requirements, you've got to be six months out of the combat zone before you can go back in. Then he asked the question, what is the problem? And I said, here's the problem, sir. I said, over there I'm a man, here I'm a child. I had done all of that, nine months came back and I could not drink a beer on Orange Avenue because I was under 21. I couldn't even vote for who sent me to Vietnam because voting was 21 then. I wasn't old enough. What did I learn from that? Gee, I guess we send children to war, don't we? Isn't that a form of child abuse? I would classify it that. Today I suffer a little post-traumatic stress, and it's from that. It's from knowing my country sent a child to war, and it still exists today. So pick your age. Are you an adult at 18? It seems to me you should be. If you are able to go kill for your country or be killed for your country, and you're old enough to do that, you ought to be old enough to smoke a joint. You're an adult, and all I'm lecturing you on is this. Government, get consistent. Come up with the age, whatever it is, and then stand by it. Don't have it be 18 here, 21 here, and I've even heard talk of 25 for cannabis. Give me a break. I can tell you this unconditionally. I've behaved far worse on alcohol than I ever have on cannabis. Thank you, uh, Governor. The only bad thing I did on cannabis, I went and saw Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And no, no clapping mem members and uh, also uh, folks in the audience. And thank you, Governors, and uh, you're a very thank you. eloquent and very captivating uh, speaker as well. And thank you for bringing the service in Vietnam and also uh, relate to minor. You know, I, I can connect to that very well, being a person among descent where a large part of my uh, community, my elder actually recruited as child soldier, you know, much younger than 18, but thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I guess I should have stayed for questions. Yes, Were there any? members. <laughs> members. Uh, I was a bit questions? rude, I apologize, I didn't realize. Any questions at any all? Any question from members? And why I came here today? It's like I said, I don't want any family to have to go through what me and my wife, the first lady, have gone through. And cannabis saved our life. Saved it. Where would we be today? I'd be running home right now if my wife was still alive watching her seas again. Because our medicine couldn't help. Could not help. Thank you. Did. Yeah, and thank you, Governor. I know that, um, I don't know if you have testified in other committee, but I'm. Um, we're honored that you pick our Thank you, and as I said, Chairman, you're the first. Okay, <laughs> take the environment, climate, and legacy uh, to tell your story.